Welcome to the Skirball Cultural Center's Rosalind and Abner Goldstein School Programs. To learn more about our Visions and Values classroom curriculum, visit skirball.org. The story you're about to hear took place over 100 years ago. It comes from a treasured member of the Skirball community, Paulette Nebrad Greenberg. This true account follows Paulette's aunt, Riva Nebrat. Riva was a Russian immigrant who came to the United States with her family in the 1920s. Her experience mirrors the harrowing challenges many immigrants to the U.S. have faced and the courage people bring with them on their journey to find a new beginning. My family is from Russia, from a village called Berdichev. I was born there in 1913. My father, Yanko, was a shoemaker, and my mama, Fega, stayed home with my two older brothers, Abe and Sam, and me, the baby's sister. Mama did the housework. She swept the dirt floors and cooked all our meals with whatever food she had on hand. After synagogue, where we went to pray and study, my brothers played hide-and-go-seek and, and stickball outside with their friends. Walking home, we listened to the sounds of the river nearby. We lived a simple life, but it was also a scary time. Our family is Jewish, like many others in our town. Across Russia, Many Jewish people experienced discrimination. It felt like we weren't welcome there anymore. Even before I was born, Jewish communities like ours were attacked simply because of our beliefs. These attacks, or pogroms, were happening all across Eastern Europe. Mama and Papa wanted to protect our family and spent many nights talking about places we could go to live safely. Sometimes, Papa would bring home the newspaper and read stories to us about the Great War and all the fighting going on around the world. It seemed that everyone was fighting someone else somewhere, and all my parents kept talking about was war, war, war. One evening, Papa told us that he was going on a journey to a country called America, across the ocean, to hopefully find a better, safer life. As soon as he was settled there, he promised to send for us. Somehow, Papa got a passport. I didn't know what a passport was, but Papa said it gave him permission to travel. I didn't want Papa to leave, but I knew he had to. The day he left, I couldn't stop crying because I didn't know when I would see him again. I already missed his calm voice and the way he laughed when he watched us play together. Once Papa was gone, my mama, Abe, Sam, and I went to live with my booby, our grandmother. I continued hearing stories of war and fighting for the next several years. I would later learn that this was the start of the Russian Revolution. Soldiers marched into our town. Some nights when I was in bed, I pulled my blanket over my ears to not hear their footsteps. When they knocked on our door, Mama kept us safe. She had us hide in the cupboards to stay out of sight. Food was scarce, and many people in town were hungry. Mama had even less food to cook for us. We didn't always know what we would have to eat. Sometimes we only had bread. Other days, it was a simple broth with a few pieces of carrots. I really hated carrots. Some blame Jewish people like me and my family for these problems. Many stores were set on fire and burned to the ground. As days went on, attacks against Jewish people 
got even worse. Broken glass was everywhere and crunched under our feet. Then the soldiers set our synagogue, our place of worship, on fire. That's when Mama knew we had to leave. I had to be brave and swallow my tears as I left my home. I kept thinking that if we leave, how would Papa find us? We had to be very careful. We'd have to leave without anyone knowing. Mama hired a guide to take us across the Russian border and into Poland. Maybe once we got there, we'd try to get in touch with Papa somehow. We could only take one small suitcase because we knew our journey would be long and difficult. We only took the most important papers, like our birth certificates. Sam and Abe wrapped a few family photographs in a handkerchief. I took my doll because I couldn't leave without her. Mama took our candlesticks for lighting at Shabbat, our Friday night family dinners. She packed her favorite pair of small blue and silver earrings. She had gotten them from her mother when she was a young girl about my age. We put all these things in a suitcase and left our home for good. As Mama closed the door behind us, I whispered goodbye to the only home I had ever known. We took the train from my hometown of Berdychev and rode for days to the border near Poland. Our guide told us that once we got there, we had to jump off the train in the middle of the night because we didn't have permission to cross into Poland. I still have a scar on my knee from when I jumped off that train. I remember running to Mama and my brothers and giving them a big hug. Once we got into Poland, we had to walk all the way to Warsaw, the capital city. It was almost 200 miles. It took us over a month to get there. We walked and walked and walked. We drank water from streams we passed and picked vegetables from fields to eat. I had always hated vegetables, especially carrots. But I learned that when you're hungry, anything, even carrots, taste good. Some nights, we got help from other Jewish people and slept in their synagogues, a place we could go to worship and for warmth. Other nights, we slept in the woods with our clothes for blankets. I often wrapped my jacket around me and pretended it was the blanket I had left behind. Eventually, we got to Warsaw. We went directly to an office called the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, a place that helped Jewish refugees like ourselves. The woman at the desk told us that Papa had already contacted them. I jumped up and down and saw my mama smiling for the very first time in weeks. We found out that Papa had sent some money and a letter telling us where he was. He was living in the United States in a place called Texas. Texas? I didn't have any idea where that was. What was a kid like me going to do in a place called Texas? We were so happy to know that Papa was safe. With the money he sent, we were able to buy tickets for the ship that would take us to America. It had been nine years since we had seen Papa. On a warm spring day in 1922, we traveled north 
to a city by the sea. In front of us was the biggest ship I'd ever seen. We were one of hundreds of families on board the Aquitania, one of the largest steamships that travel between Europe and the United States. Those with the least expensive tickets traveled in steerage, the lowest deck of the ship, where it was often crowded with people and had no windows for fresh air. We were lucky to afford our tickets in second class. This meant Mama, Abe, Sam, and I could stay in one tiny room together. We also got tickets for daily meals, so we knew we wouldn't be hungry anymore. My brothers and I would play with other children on board and peek through the windows into the first-class dining room. We saw people dressed up in fancy clothes, and my eyes grew wide seeing the silver spoons and teacups on tables. Weeks passed, and on July 1st, 1922, we finally arrived in New York Harbor. Before us, we saw a statue of a woman with one arm stretched up high, holding a torch in the air. Later I would learn it was called the Statue of Liberty, enlightening the world. Mama said we are now in a place where we don't have to hide our beliefs and we'll have an opportunity for a better life. As I looked up at the Statue of Liberty, I realized that we brought with us more than things that fit into our small suitcase. We carried our memories of Berdichev, our Jewish traditions, courage in our hearts, the hope that our lives would be safer, and that we would see Papa again. That hope is how we really survive. We had arrived at Ellis Island. My feet hurt from the journey, and we now had to stand in long lines waiting to answer questions and be looked at by doctors. We were surrounded by other families. I looked at girls who wore clothing different from mine. I couldn't understand some of the languages they were speaking. I huddled next to Mama and wondered how I would ever make friends in this brand new country. Once our inspection was finished, we were sent on our way. As we walked, I saw a wall of people waiting to greet the newcomers from our ship. Many people were waving, including a tall man with a beard. It was Papa! He hugged Mama so tight I thought she was going to disappear. His eyes grew wide as he looked at us. You're so tall. I can't believe how big you are. He kept saying how proud he was of us. He hugged us one by one. I kept stroking his beard, which had turned gray. He looked bigger and taller than I remembered. But his voice was calm and steady as it always was. We were finally all together again. We took a train to Texas where we'd be living. While we were on the train, someone offered me a banana. I didn't know what it was or how to eat this fruit. It was a strange yellow thing with thick, heavy peel. I looked around at my mama, papa, Abe, and Sam, and took a bite. I thought, if America is this good, I'm going to like it here. This project is part of the Skirball Cultural Center's Roslyn and Abner Goldstein School Programs. It was produced by Anna Schwarz and Lori Nierswick and voiced by Francine Kubrin. Mixing and sound design by Kara Hart. 
This story was recorded by Mike DeLay at Real Voice LA. And of course, thanks to Paulette Nebrad Greenberg for sharing her family story, which continues to inspire.